Matters online conference. Uh, this has been a wonderful day and we have another great panel coming up now. Uh, this one is on challenges and opportunities for neurodivergent inclusion in collegiate arts. Uh, so great stuff to talk about. Uh, we have the wonderful Michael John Carley here uh, to moderate the discussion. So now I'm gonna hand it over to him. Take it away, Michael. Thank you, Clay. Uh, welcome everybody to uh, what I think is gonna be a really, really wonderful panel. Um, I'm going to ask the panelists actually to introduce themselves primarily in just a moment. Uh, but I'd first like to just share with you just a little bit about my background. And then if I'm doing my job as the moderator, that will be the last you hear about my personal experiences. So I wear a lot of different hats in the autism Asperger world. Um, I've started nonprofits, I've consulted for schools, I write, I speak, yada, yada, yada. I was diagnosed um, back when I was a minor league diplomat uh, during the day and a starving playwright by night along with my then four-year-old son as what we now know as the autism spectrum. And so Clay having sort of brought me back to this um, after you know, years and years of a theater career that you know, I just figured was long and dead. You know? So this has been a real joy uh, for me to kind of you know, reinvigorate all those old feelings and remember how the arts benefit me so much in two particular areas. Um, just having to do with my autism. Number one, of course, was theory of mind issues, because before theater, I promise you, I was one of those people that could not comprehend that somebody else was thinking something differently than I was thinking. And I remember those first encounters when you're playing with characters and the director's like, Michael, you understand that the character is thinking something differently from you. And you're thinking to yourselves, are you kidding me? What, why would you say that? Um, and it also helped me, you know, sort of resolve a lot of motor skills issues because finally as there was this person monitoring my body sometimes in cruel manners that you know I didn't exactly appreciate at the time but you know Michael what are you doing with your hands well I never noticed I was doing anything with my hands and you know whether we want to go down that road as to what's proper assimilation or what's not so long as assimilation is being done within the context of choices I'm all for it and I did want to at least know how other people thought of what my body looked at. And there was nothing like a theater director to tell you what you looked like. So it benefited me tremendously. If you're after any more of my information, I of course have one of those shamelessly self-promotional author websites. Um, it's michaeljohncarley.com. But this particular panel, you're in for a treat because as, you, as Clay told you, it's a mouthful of a title, okay? And we know that challenges and opportunities, a la the title, sometimes converge into one happy little kernel there and sometimes aren't so uh, irregardless of one another. Uh, we have professors, we have university think tank people here, and we have a couple of students too, so, or former students. And I'm a former student of, a, of an MFA program myself, so maybe I'll sneak something in. But uh, Mark, starting with you, and then Leon, Ava, and Dave, Take it away and introduce yourselves to everybody. And just thank you all again so much for joining us. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm Mark Charney. I am director of the School of Theater and Dance at Texas Tech. Uh, for 27 years or so, I was at Clemson University and I've directed an English program and uh, now theater and dance. Uh, I think one of the reasons I'm here is that I'm Clay's mentor. Uh, when he came to earn his MFA at Texas Tech, he was the person responsible for our connecting and partnering with the Burkhart Center for Studies in Autism. And we created um, under Clay's uh, sort of mentorship, a relationship we call it Burke Tech Players. And Burke Tech Players is an organization that's run sort of equally by those in the spectrum and some of our students. So I think that's why I'm here and thanks for having me, Michael. Thank you, Mark. Dave? Hi, my name is Dave Osmondson. I am an MFA student in dramatic writing at Arizona State University. Uh, today's actually my last day of classes, so yay! Um, I'm a playwright and I'm also a dramaturg and I was diagnosed with Asperger's when I was three years old. Okay, thank you. Ava? Hello, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Ava Rigelhaupt, and um, I'll, I'm, I will be graduating Sarah Lawrence College, which is in um, New York State this May. And, um, yeah. and um, <laughs> I, um, I am a founding member of Spectrum Theater Ensemble, 
uh, since 2017. So I've known Clay for a while. And through that, I worked with um, Trinity Repertory Company to produce their first full sensory friendly season. Um, and this year at Sarah Lawrence College through being a um, Rudman Foundation Rudman Family Foundation um, Inclusion Ambassador, I work to um, add accessibility onto my campus. And so I also brought my sensory friendly work over to school and helped them create a, a, um, a show, a production of, um, they were putting on Head Over Heels. So I helped make them, um, helped them make that musical sensory friendly for that year, along with a panel um, similar to this um, of industry professionals who are interested in accessibility for all people and people with autism. Excellent, Ava. Thank you. But I must tell you that, you know, obviously you're lacking a little bit of media control skills because you've clearly got the press banging on your door wanting to hear about, you know, <laughs> your opinions as we go through this panel here. But um, Leon, welcome. Hi, thanks. Uh, good to be with everyone. Um, my name is Leon Hilton. I'm an assistant professor of theater and performance studies at Brown University. Um, so I'm coming to you from Providence. Um, and yeah, I'm, uh, some of my academic work is Look, looking at representations of um, autism, disability, and neurodiversity in theater and performance, but I'm also kind of interested more broadly in how um, questions around neurodiversity can sort of shift our understanding of what performance means and sort of theories of performativity and how we understand um, those terms and related concepts. So, um, and I've also been kind of collaborating with uh, Spectrum for um, a, a couple of years now, and it's it's really great that um, they're local. So it's been really <laughs> nice to have a uh, connection between our department and this, this really exciting, I think, innovative and kind of um, uh, theater company that's like, you're really at the forefront of this conversation. So happy to be with you all. Excellent. Thank you, Leon. You know, I forgot to mention also, I too am a native, former native of Providence, Rhode Island, <laughs> and it was where I grew up. So there's been that connection as well. But Leon, maybe we should stick with you if you don't mind, because you know how we, you just described your work I think it sounds to me like there's a challenge and an opportunity that you could probably jump right into to start us off. Would you mind? Um, yeah, sure. Well, I mean, when we sort of were having a conversation in preparation for this panel um, and you asked us to sort of think about this question. Um, yeah, I think, you know, one of the challenges that came to mind immediately was trying to think about, um, you know, so often I think work in disability maybe, or particularly around, um, autism, neurodiversity um, happens under the auspices of maybe some other kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, institution on campus. So maybe that's like a medical school or a public health school or an education, you know, school of education. And often, or, you know, um, often the conversation around disability happens in relationship to these sort of like hel helping professions, people who are training to go into therapeutics in some way or med medical fields. Um, and I think that one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is how neurodiversity really can be understood more properly as a kind of social or cultural or political movement. Um, and you know, what does it mean to kind of carve out a space for thinking about neurodiversity that is separate from um, the kind of uh, you know professional um, uh, training in kind of uh, therapy or medicine or um, other kinds of uh, um, fields in which um, experiences of autistic people or people, uh, neurodivergent people, aren't necessarily at the center of who's making the kind of decisions around those kinds of questions. So, I mean, I think one of the challenges that I've, you know, been trying to kind of work through or think about is, you know, how do we kind of um, create uh, disability cultural spaces that are kind of autonomous or kind of um, uh, working on their own terms. Um, and um, so, yeah, that's like a challenge. And I think, uh, uh, and, and not to say that, you know, I'm uh, collaborations with medical schools or public health schools or other kinds of, or, you know, neuroscience research isn't um, an exciting and important aspect of this work. I think it really can it's be. It's a theater but, conference, you're good. <laughs> but I just think that, you know, it's really, um, you know, how do we really foreground the kind of artistic um, integrity, right, of this work and having it not be attached to any kind of other motivation, right? Um, and so I think there's a lot of complicated questions around that and I'd be happy to kind of talk more about that. Um, and then I could also talk about an opportunity. I don't know uh, if I should keep going, but I could also pause there. <laughs> 
Well, I tell you what, what I'd like to do especially is sort of come up with follow-up questions for all four of you. And I've got yours based on what okay. you told me. So I'll come back, definitely. Great. Ava, can we go next to you? What are some of the challenges and opportunities that you especially as a present student see? Yeah, so I think as Leon was saying that I came up with some ideas from our meeting um, about this panel. And to make it a little bit more general, I think one of the challenges and opportunities is just generally um, that schools need to um, become more aware of the vast differences of disabilities and accessibilities, et cetera, uh, both physical and um, uh, mental disabilities that are on the college campus. And I think that's one of the challenges um, because people can, can be aware of them, but because there's so many and they're so nuanced, many people feel it's like trying to solve global warming that you just don't know where to start and that, um, and so they don't start anywhere. Um, and, and they're really, it, it can be a struggle, of course, because what can really help with one person with autism might not help another person with autism. Um, but that also can be a, uh, an opportunity because you can, um, work with people and, and talk about it and try many different things, such as some people might not like sensory friendly shows, um, and some people might really like them. And so, um, I think that's what's really interesting. And so it was also interesting when I was working with Trinity that they had some of those shows altered and some of them just with a sensory trigger list. And I think it was really great because not everyone wants a full altered show. Um, some people just want like a warning, like there's going to be a gunshot here. And also many people with PTSD um, in Rhode Island from veterans, et cetera, um, also were not expecting that, but were actually very happy at the end. They're like, wow, this was really helpful during death of a salesman. So I think that that's a challenge and an opportunity for any institution. Okay, excellent, thank you. And my gosh, did I get the question for you. Um, Dave, can we go to you? Sure, um, I think in terms of um, challenges, I think one challenge that I notice a lot of my students who are on the spectrum is feeling seen and feeling like there is someone who's on their side and an ally. And something that I, um, that I tend to do is I'm very open about my autism. I think there was one class where like I kind of just said it as a thing that not a lot of people know about me because a lot of people don't know I'm autistic right off the bat. And I had a few students come up to me and say, you know, thank you for being so open about that. So I think there is an opportunity there in being more open about our um, autism as professors and people in higher ed to help students feel seen. And I think another um, challenge taking that a little further is having uh, LGBTQ students who are on the autism spectrum um, be seen. And I think there's an opportunity there of how can they navigate um, not just the theater community, which is built very much on relationships, but maybe also even the queer community. Um, that's just um, something that I can start thinking about. I don't have much else to say, but I think there is an opportunity there to um, be an ally for not just um, students on the spectrum, but also LGBTQ students on the spectrum. Can I say, I'm gonna ask you a pointed uh, question now in addition to the follow-up question. Can you maybe just elaborate more on, and whether this is the queer community or your students with autism, you know, what you mean by being seen? I mean, I think I know, but I would love to hear you sort of, you know, elaborate more on that. Sure, um, being seen, um, I think another way of putting it would be, um, being acknowledged, um, as if to say, yes, um, like we're. But we is this identity, to... or is this through just knowledge secondhand that oh that person's queer or that person's on the spectrum? Um, I think it's identity. Okay. okay. Yeah, I don't have like a fully formed answer, but <laughs> yeah, I I would say it's identity. Yeah. Like basically just communicating to students like, look, you are, you are not alone, we're all in this together, et cetera. Okay, okay. Thank you, I appreciate that. Mark, thank you for waiting. What's yeah, your no challenge problem. and opportunity? You know, as a director of a program, um, I always look at the opportunities sort of based on uh, the connection that we've made. Uh, at the beginning, I think what you have to do is have students who are really interested in helping to reach out with populations that are other. And I, I understand what you're saying, Dave, in, in terms of being seen. Um, ours started with a theater and dance in the community class. And so when I took over, a couple of years into it, we realized that if we weren't serving the community, uh, we really weren't serving the population we should have been serving. 
So we put together a course called Theater and Dance in the Community, and we went all over, um, wherever people needed us. We had graduates working with undergraduate students, and we were sharing the idea of art. Well, three of those classes were with the Autism Center, the Burkhart Autism Center. And we realized that there was a terrific connection there. There was a terrific need there. In the middle of the first semester, a young man who was 11, who had never spoken before, said, I want my voice to be heard. In the middle of an exercise, when you have I mean, that's a wonderful moment, right? That's the sort of thing that swells your heart. You're not going to have that all the time, but we had this success enough with our students who had no training on how to work with students on the spectrum, but just came at it with all their heart, right? So the opportunities are plentiful. We, as theater artists and practitioners or dance artists and practitioners, want to learn to communicate with every sort of population that we can. Um, and so we found that creating the Burke Tech Players, which was run by students in our program and students on the spectrum equally with an artistic director shared, um, boy, we learned a lot. We learned a lot. Our students learned a lot. They learned a lot. Um, suddenly we became part of this bigger thing. Um, the challenges are always seemingly financial. Um, right now, this has gotten to be such a major thing that out of 52 graduate students who have assistantships and fellowships, something like 11 work with our connection with the Burkhart Center. Not all of them 20 hours, but, but a lot of folks work there. And we're adding two extra productions a year. We're adding workshops. Um, believe it or not, financial isn't really a challenge. Um, you can put this work together with people who are just willing. So I think the biggest challenge, um, Michael, would, to, would be to begin this. I mean, start this. Have somebody who's interested in starting it. And you don't have to, you know, have buckets of knowledge to communicate with people who are willing. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm going to go in reverse order. And I'm going to sort of ask the follow-up question, actually, of you. Okay. And that is that, you know, you mentioned, you know, the finances, you know, as maybe not being, you know, the biggest hurdle up there, but it is a hurdle for a lot of people. And, but you pose a good question in the context that, you know, just because you have a bunch of money, what would you do with it to make it more inclusive, to make a more inclusive department? Yeah. Um, if, as the administrator of this panel, um, if I dropped, you know, a million dollar donation on you and told you, use this money to make your department infinitely more inclusive of everybody it doesn't even have to be neurodiverse students of everybody how do you go about spending that money well you know we're always we're always doing productions we always need a place to go we always need graduate students who are going to work and study to train we always need um you know some compensation for students who are putting all of this time in after hours on the weekends um, you know, I'd love to pay artists. I always love to pay artists, but our graduate students who are working are paid. And over the Burkhart Center, um, Dr. Dotson, who runs that center, also pays their students for being involved. So you never don't want to pay artists. Um, we, the level of sophistication in terms of the theater that we produce, um, that can be more elaborate if we have a bigger budget. Uh, we could also reach out maybe beyond the Burkhart Center. I mean, that's where we're sort of landed and that's the population we're serving. Um, but they also pay quite a, a bit to be part of that center. And we may be missing a population in the community who's not paying through the Burkhart Center that we could reach out for. We also could bring in guest artists um, who are more well-versed at working artists who are well versed at working like a lot of you. I mean, I could see bringing in each of you uh, to sort of help what we're doing. And we do bring in guest artists, um, Jason Williams, the sort of famous author of Greater Tuna, um, uh, has a, a son uh, who is severely on the spectrum. He took a great interest. So he was volunteering left and right at the very beginning, uh, but we'd like to have a more structured sense. I know I wanna bring Clay and uh, Spectrum Theater in to introduce NICE this year. And that's gonna cost some money, right? Because you mm -hmm. wanna pay for travel, you wanna put them up. Um, we've done some work with sensory, uh, uh, sensory friendly shows. We need to have every one of our shows sensory friendly. Uh, we do. And uh, 
It's not like, oh, let's play with this with one show. I mean, to me, if we're serving a population, so that probably cost a bit too. Okay, thank you. Um, Dave, I'm gonna switch back to you going in the reverse order thing. And I hope you don't mind um, this question. And you know, please tell me if you do or you don't, but um, I'm old enough not to age myself out here, but you know, I was doing theater you know, in New York during the entirety pretty much of the AIDS crisis. And I certainly can remember how just, you know, as somebody who embraced the theater community, probably in part, not just because I liked theater, but also because I was weird. And this was a community of people that, you know, were okay with the fact that I was weird. Um, and I think that there was a lot of that, you know, for the LGBTQ community back then. And as a younger person, I'm kind of wondering, you know, especially if the LGBTQ, you know, population feels the need to be seen you know, that you're seeing that, you know, in your population. I'm wondering, you know, has maybe the relevance because the rest of the world isn't so homophobic as it used to be. Has that almost made the need for theater that the LGBTQ community so clearly, you know, wanted and desired, has that kind of made the need for theater almost dissipate to the point where we now need to start creating programs to encourage the LGBTQ populations to come back to the theater. Could you talk on that? Sure. Um, I mean, even if there is generally less homophobia in the world, there is always going to be homophobia some there. That's a social, oh, that's never going to go away. And I think um, there's also um, a really interesting intersection that hasn't really been explored with um, queerness and autism. I was talking in the panel earlier today about how um, I feel like autism is a way of kind of queering neurotypicality. Um, I think what, what I see a lot of in contemporary entertainment surrounding the LGBTQ community is that a lot of the I feel like the narrative of the white straight passing male who comes out as gay is kind of the um, has become like the dominant narrative. And I think there is a huge opportunity for more diverse stories within the LGBTQ community, um, especially in terms of disability. I mean, I think the only, again, I said this in my last answer, I think the only um, story I can think of that deals with um, LGBTQ and disability is the Netflix series Special, which is great if you haven't seen it. And I think okay. there, it's really good. Okay. And cool. um, I, I'm personally interested in exploring in my work kind of about, again, the intersection between autism and queerness. So I think there's always gonna be another story about the LGBTQ experience to tell, regardless of um, whether there is homophobia or not in the world. Because I think there are still so many facets of that experience that have not been explored and I think could be explored through more intersectionality. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna actually comment on that if you don't mind, because one of the nonprofits that I founded in New York was an organization called GRASP, which at the time was the largest membership organization for adults on the spectrum of the world. And, you know, of all of our, I think we had roughly 9,000, you know, fully subscribed, you know, members, you know, when I left in 2013, um, but we had an infinitely higher percentage of LGBTQ folks in our membership than mm. the neurotypical world would present. And, you know, I maybe was oversimplifying, you know, my interpretation of that. And that is just that when you have already gone through the painful process of coming out about anything, whether you're on the spectrum or whether you're LGBTQ to the rest of the world, that maybe that just makes the second coming out process mm. infinitely easier because you know you're not gonna die, you know, basically when that, after that first coming out process is over and you're like, oh my God, you know, quote unquote, it gets better, you know, whichever one it might be. Would you agree with that? Um, I mean, I think both queerness and autism are stigmatized in different ways. Um, I've generally seen more hostility toward, I, okay, so I guess um, I've generally seen more of a hostility towards LGBTQ people. And I feel like with um, the autism- In Arizona now, remember. That's fine. Um, and I feel like the, um, a lot of the stigmatization from the autistic community kind of comes more of a lack of understanding, I think, 
about what how autistic people see the world. And that's why I think it's really important to, in plays about neurodiversity, to really center those narratives. Because I see a lot of stories about how neurotypical people relate with um, autistic people. And I think we need to see more stories that center um, autistic people and how they see the world in order to foster um, a larger understanding. And I think art and theater can be really, really um, conducive in accomplishing that. Thank you. Um, there was actually a second point too, which I'll, I'll just throw out there before I pass it on. But um, the whole notion that, you know, folks like you and I don't really pick up on gender expectation, you know, as much as neurotypicals do in the early stages. And while that's always been thought of as a detriment, um, I think it's actually an incredible attribute that just allows us to be ourselves, you know, so much easier uh, than most folks have it. Thank you for answering that question. I really appreciate it. Um, Welcome, Ava. You. Um, I would like to ask you a question because a lot of what you talked about, you know, sort of emanated from this idea of maybe you've encountered some, you know, college administrations, which maybe just have a little bit of a push pull thing going on and that might be resistant to ideas that, yeah, see, I didn't want to get you fired, Leon. So I'm asking Ava this question. Um, <laughs> um you know, and the whole concept of, you know, what to you is a no brainer. Why are you hitting a brick wall when you, you know, submit, you know, these ideas to the administration? And from my experience, at least in the employment world and dealing with corporate types for, you know, folks on the, on the spectrum trying to get internships, one of the things that I clearly had to quickly realize was that the secret to success in these matters was making the company or the administration confident that they could make the experiment work. Mm -hmm. And if you can, and Mark, I might come back to you on this because you probably have a lot to say on this as well, but if you can make that institution confident that there's not gonna be you know, any drawbacks that you know, will have them answering to their trustees or to their shareholders, um, that it's really almost you know, a salesmanship job that granted because of our diagnosis, sometimes we suck at. Would you agree with that? And if so, how would you come about you know, changing that or making that sales pitch? And if you don't agree with that, what would be your strategy for changing institutions? First, I don't understand your question. Sure. You had proposed, I think, some ideas where you had brought maybe, you know, some sense of the challenges and opportunities of making your particular theater department more inclusive. Correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So let's say you get the opportunity, you get a pipeline to the president of the university, and you have the most no-brainer piece of inclusive strategy to go bring to that president. And to your chagrin and to your surprise, the university president is like, ah, uh, wait a minute, I don't know about this. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is usually the secret isn't to tell him that it's a no-brainer, he has to do it, because that's just gonna freak him out even more. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is also that he needs to be made confident that the experiment can work. And I'm asking you if you agree with that assessment and if so, what would be one particular thing that you could see yourself changing on the campus of Sarah Lawrence? And if you don't agree with that idea, how else would you go about bringing change on Sarah Lawrence's campus? Well, so through my rudiment inclusion ambassadorship, I aimed to, um, so the Rudman Family Foundation is this large, um, you know, but I'm just saying for the other people, um, is this large organization um, that works with colleges and through with the colleges, um, Hillel, which is a Jewish organization on campus. Um, they have different ambassadors on campuses to create uh, awareness of accessibility and disabilities. And so um, different people do different things. One person like, you know, for example, I use a simple example, you know, like built a ramp or another person had an inclusive um, Shabbat dinner event. And so my event was to work with the theater, um, theater, uh, uh, not company, theater program to um, create a sensory friendly show. And um, similar to what I did with Trinity. And so, um, Sarah Lawrence College recently has this really new great um, uh, head of the director of the theater company, director of the theater program. And so when I was you know, formulating my idea with my advisor that I get when I am an uh, inclusion ambassador, um, you know, I talked to the head of the theater company and he was, luckily for me, he was already right on board um, because he wants to create 
um, a more inclusive environment because I was also talking to him about um, regardless of me being on the spectrum I think a lot of people had this problem of you know um, sometimes feeling like over the years um, auditioning for things and not getting cast in shows and I think sometimes that has to do with being on the spectrum and I think sometimes it doesn't um, you know Santa Lawrence is a small school we would have about 1,000 like 600 people and so sometimes you know it's who you know which is real life but even more big more um, fishbowl-y at college campus you know <laughs> if the director isn't your friend you ain't getting cast you know and I get that like like if I like if I was, that directing was my undergrad show, too so like if I was directing a show I would also be like I'm casting my friends like because you know you want to work with them but also it's it's um you know that first impression can be very hard for people on the spectrum because you gotta make it and you gotta do it and it doesn't sometimes come across confidently or as great as you would like to and already everyone neurotypical is not nervous in an audition setting and so but luckily for me for my project he was already on board and a lot of the teachers so at my school um the teachers they've heard rumors about sensory friendly and like ooh, da, 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 da. and it was the students who totally had like no clue what was going on so i explained <laughs> so i explained it to them and they watched me work with the you know director of the musical head over heels to make it sensory friendly and to add red warning lights and so um, I think it really helps if you have like, you know, um, so then the head of the, the director, the um, president of the college came um, to me during one of the dinners and she said, um, she unfortunately wasn't able to come, but she said, I heard, you know, many great things because the dean of students came to my panel, etc. And so I think, you know, yeah, so if you have um, a couple of people that are high up on your team, then you know um, other people just like how people like to follow people they'll be like oh well this seems neat you know i guess i'll also join along with them um so i was able to work with you know like the tech crew was all very on board because the director of the show was telling them they should do it and so um i think to answer to try to answer your question which i think is a little bit better for leon or mark um but um yeah so you have to try to find allies in in the um departments and luckily, uh, these people were really interested in making theater um, more accessible and um, uh, breaking it open a little bit more to the college campus. It was getting a little stuffy. Okay, great. That's thank you. Um, if you don't mind, Ava, I would just like to give you one interpretation. You sort of gave a glass half empty interpretation of a certain phenomenon, which is the inevitable clickishness of college theater departments, especially on small campuses. Mm -hmm. My undergrad was at Hampshire, so I certainly you know, know what that school yeah, size is like. Um, but I think there's a glass half full version of that, which is that especially if you can put, you know, put on your director hat as opposed to your actor hat, you'll remember that it's not that you just wanna cast your friends, you wanna cast people that you trust. Mm -hmm. and that you know I've never been a director but yes I oh okay okay but you know it is that thing where you know you want you want to make sure that you know you're casting people that will listen to and adhere to your direction as opposed to you know be confrontational you know or what have you yeah, so yeah. there's a little bit of that in there as well thank you that was awesome and I'm sorry if I was like you know really wordy and trying to get that question out initially um so Leon I got a big one for you because you're kind of the big picture guy here um, and yet at the same point, I think the people watching this would love to hear from you. It doesn't have to just be at Brown because I really mean that. I don't want you to get fired. Um, but if you could give us at least one, if not two, maybe even three concrete examples of where you could see the most well-intentioned theater department trying to be inclusive um, going wrong. Hmm. Going wrong. Um, well, you know, I don't know that I. Um, While you know, you're I mean, thinking this through, I apologize. Yeah. I just wanted to represent. While you're thinking this through, if others could think, I would love to see this panel's next step be a gestation of where, if you can think of questions for each other while Leon mm -hmm. answers this, that would be wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that it's so much about. Um, Going wrong. I mean, I think that you know. Um, Good point. Uh, I don't know. I mean, there's there's various ways we could take this, right? I mean, um, I think one of the conversations that people are very actively trying to you know think about um, in uh, yeah, sort of theater, theater education, theater pedagogy, how we 
um, how theater kind of happens in ed educational environments, but I think also this is a conversation that's happening in theaters more generally is, you know, how do we um, grapple with the question of who can tell whose stories and in, on what terms are certain experiences represented and who's included in the room, right, when those decisions get made. And I think it's not only about sort of the stories that are told at the narrative level, but it's also told, it's also about the sort of formal level, right? So how, um, how those stories are told, not just what stories are told, um, and who the audience is, in, uh, who, who's imagined to be the audience for these stories um, or, or performances, and also who's imagined to be the artists who are kind of creating them. Um, and so I think that, you know, when we talk about where things go wrong, um, you know, I think um, this is not distinct to, distinct to disability or to neurodiversity, but I think we could, might think about, um, you know, productions of plays that have kind of damaging or stereotypical or outdated representations of disability or autism um, or mental illness. Um, you know, I think there's particular um, issues uh, with representation that, you know, scholarship and disability studies has sort of taught us to think about, right? So when is disability or kind of um, used as a kind of metaphorical trope that's actually um, about sort of producing certain kinds of emotional responses from an audience um, that um, don't actually do anything to sort of further the um, um, material kind of conditions of disabled people in the real world. Um, that's a, a, a conversation, you know, is, is disability used as a kind of um, fetishistic, uh, you know, representation or is disability used to kind of only garner sympathy for a character in a way that feels manipulative or that feels kind of, um, you know, there's also this trope within the disability community of sort of like sympathy porn, right? Or like, um, you know, or- Inspiration or porn. Inspiration porn, yeah. right, exactly. Yeah. Um, so I think that, you know, all of those kinds of, um, we could call them like pitfalls, right, of representation, um, certainly I think is something that um, theater companies, theater departments are trying to be increasingly aware of. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess I would say that it's, it's always just a question of who's involved in the process, who, you know, whose perspectives are valued and trying to make sure that if you are trying to represent a, a narrative or a story or an experience um, that people are in the room who can like speak to that in a way that you know, kind of grounds um, grounds the art that they're making in um, some actual kind of reality, right? Um, so I guess that's like one answer. Um, I don't know if that was concrete enough. <laughs> but, it wasn't, but I think you're a big yeah. picture guy, so that's okay. <laughs> I'm going to stick with you though, because I do want to ask a follow up based on that. Because one of the things that you you know you sort of steered us into, which we hadn't gone into before, is was autism within the greater context of wider disability and. Mm -hmm. You know, do you think that there's something at play because we could include disability in the wider spectrum of diversity and inclusion, which includes race, gender, sexual orientation, disability, veteran status, culture. Mm -hmm. um, and when we look at disability within, you know, not to compare, you know, with the other elements of traditional diversity and, inclu and inclusion, but if you have, you know, let's say at a company, an employee resource group, which is basically just a support group for your African-American men they're going to be all very, very unique and different individuals. But at the same point, there will be some semblance of, I'm not comfortable talking to people that aren't African-American men at this company. And that's what justifies this employee resource group and makes it really worthwhile. Um, however, you know, one of the things that I've certainly noticed is that when it comes to disabilities out of all those core aspects of DNI, that's when everybody just throws up their hands and just says, I can't understand it because we have such, you know, a wide range of, you know, you can break it down further with, you know, physical disabilities and non-apparent disabilities. And even from there, you've got an incredible range of things having to do with health issues, psychological issues, neurological issues. And it's really the intimidation factor that I think that we present that really makes us so, so hard um, to get the kind of social progress that others can get with less effort. Um, do you sort of, find that as an element that you're seeing at least in theater? Yeah, I mean, um, I think uh, I could think of a number of different ways to kind of come at that question. Um, you know, one of which would just be, 
I think it's sometimes useful to think kind of um, maybe in a historical perspective, like how does the category of disability come to be, in, you know, understood as a particular kind of identity category, right? Um, so I think we might think about, you know, the origins of like the disability rights movement, right, in the um, 60s and 70s, that is really coming out of a kind of um, a critique of what, what comes to be called the kind of medical model, right, of, of disability. And so here's a moment where there becomes, um, it's not like the category of disability has always existed, right? I mean, there have been these discrete, um, you know, experiences that all of a sudden for particular reasons get kind of lumped together. And, you know, I think it would, I would be remiss if I didn't say that I think the reason that that happens um, has to do with um, the emergence of industrial capitalism and the kind of imperative to work and to have a kind of relationship to labor. So disability is actually a category that gets invented in order to kind of define someone who's quote unquote, not seen as able to work or be a kind of productive, um, uh, productive worker, right? Uh, and therefore to qualify perhaps for some kind of um, social welfare benefits that enable them to kind of survive without having to work. Um, and so I think that, you know, if we understand disability as this kind of constructed category that does pull together so many uh, multiplicities of experiences that are either, you know, they're, people are born with them, people acquire them, right? Sometimes they get disabled on the job, for example. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things that's really powerful about thinking about disability as an identity is that um, it's, it's one that's sort of formed through kind of shared experience of marginalization. Um, and what is being, what what people are marginalized from is the kind of um, status of the fully productive kind of worker or laborer, right? And so I think out of that actually comes a really kind of powerful critique of the kind of norm or, or the expectation that everyone need, in order to be kind of fully human, you need to be a kind of fully autonomous worker or somebody who's able to kind of reproduce yourself through your labor um, and or sustain yourself through your labor. And I think that, um, you know, that's, uh, that's sometimes lost when we kind of um, just lump in disability as a kind of another category of difference and a kind of multicultural inclusion model, right? So if we say, oh, it's like race, it's like sexuality, it's like gender. I mean, it is and it isn't, right? It doesn't kind of work in that way. Um, yeah, I, I think, think the comparative value is pretty useless. In, yeah, in so I think- In the of things, but I just yeah. wanted to sort of touch on the complexity. Leon, forgive me though, we've just got a few minutes left, we've just been told. And I wanted to give everybody a chance if, you know, panelists, do you have a question for each other? Dave. So um, I think this was um, Ava who brought up um, doing, Ava or Leon, I'm so sorry, who um, brought up producing potentially problematic um, productions involving disability or autism. I'm, I, I'm wondering, hypothetically, if a theater or university decides to produce a problematic play about like disability and autism, how can we as autistic people and allies of the autism community uh, engage with it in a productive and respectful manner that uh, Ava and went straight up. Yeah, so one thing that I think Clay once said when we were doing an in a play, a new play or something, or someone once said, um, is are we trying to do life as it is or life as we wish it to be? And, you know, so I think TV often tries to answer that question, right? Like, I don't know, a lot of people like to watch this show called like, This Is Us, but I see it as life as it is. And I don't want to watch life as it is. I want to watch either like really worse life, post-apocalyptic or like really great. And so in my opinion, in my opinion, if, you know, there's like, you know, a lot of plays have like problematic stuff, just where, when they're written or, or purposefully. And so you have to see, mm -hmm. I think in my opinion, if it's like when they're written or purposefully just um, um, to begin the conversation. Like, when is that play set? Let's see what it's trying to say. Let's see how we can critique it, but what we can learn from it and possibly change mm -hmm. if it's um, quote unquote, you know, shiny people with disabilities in a bad light. Um, and so, so I think we shouldn't just shut it down, but you know, it creates more of a conversation and it maybe should make people feel uncomfortable. That's what some pl plays want to do. And I think that's sometimes interesting if it does. Ava, that's excellent. Dave, that's an excellent question too. Thank you so much for doing it. I have to 
stop us because uh, we're, we're just like uh, one minute out. So I am so sorry. Um, but we could have gone on and on as I think the audience is well clear and you know, just thank the four of these panelists please with your comments on Facebook um, because they're wonderful and hopefully you'll be able to you know, get in contact with them outside of this particular conference. And with that, um, I will just turn it back over to Clay if he's around and uh, is willing to take it. But just thank you. Thank you, Clay, for thank giving you. us all this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much. And yes, there's so much more to talk about. I would love to bring you guys back in uh, sometime during the festival to have some more conversations. So uh, thank you all so much again. And thank you everyone for viewing. Um, we're going to take a quick break, but beforehand, if you've enjoyed these discussions and uh, uh, engaging with us, we are looking for support in lead up to our Neurodiversity New Play Festival this summer. Um, so some ways you can support us. The easiest way and what would really help is just to share these videos and to share the word about us with your community on your group pages, on your personal page, uh, so that more people know about us. Uh, other ways you can support us, we have a Facebook fundraiser for Autism Awareness Month on our Facebook page that you can donate to. You can also donate uh, directly for the, fest, uh, for the conference, and you can go onto our website, www.stensemble.org, and there's an easy way to donate through PayPal there. But thank you all again.